Welcome to the Skeptic Zone, the podcast from Australia for science and reason. Yes, it's the Skeptic Zone podcast, episode number 785 for the 22nd of October, 2023. Richard Saunders coming to you this week from Oakland, California, where in the last few days we had a heat wave and an earthquake. I don't think the two were related. Coming up on this week's show, you can count on Adrian with Adrian Hill and the welcome return of Cat McLeod from... Edmonton, Canada. In this segment, Kat's going to tell Adrian about her experiences with so-called natural medicine and natural supplements. A cautionary tale. It's all very well, something being labelled natural. You think of wonderful things like butterflies and birds and dolphins. But in reality, a lot of what is natural is dangerous, deadly, poisonous, bad. I think you get the idea. Natural supplements, the dangers of them with Adrian and Kat. Following that, Adrian returns with this week's newsletter written by Tim Mendham, What's Happening in the World of Skepticism. Then to round off the episode, the Trove Archive looks at an interesting case of the paranormal in Washington. What are those politicians up to, or what were they up to many years ago? Now, here's a recommendation for a fantastic few hours you can have 30 years ago. Huh? Over at Maynard at maynard.com.au, Maynard has put up one of his famous Triple J afternoon radio programs from October 1993. Fabulous music and fabulous interviews people ringing up, quizzes, all sorts of things from 30 years ago. Check it out. Head to maynard.com.au and download his Triple J show from 30 years ago. Well, that's enough for me. It's time for me to run out the door, run around the corner, run down the street and see if I can find a breakfast burrito. Hmm. While I do that, I hope you enjoy The Skeptic Zone. You can count on Adrian with Adrian Hill. Hello, everyone. This is Adrian Hill from Skookum Studios in Calgary, Canada. And today I have a good friend of the show, Kat McLeod, all the way from Edmonton, three hours north of where I live. Welcome, Kat. Hi, Adrian. Thanks for having me back. It is a pleasure. And today we're going to talk about Kat's personal story, which she has written about in an upcoming Skeptical Inquirer article, which I think is pretty awesome. Do you know any more details, Kat? It will be published in the November-December Skeptical Inquirer, so I'm anxiously awaiting that to hit the store shelves. On August 2023, the World Health Organization posted a tweet, I think it was still a tweet then, or an X, whatever you want to call it, and it stated, for millions of people around the world, hashtag traditional medicine is their first stop for health and well-being. Which of these have you used? Acupuncture, Ayurveda, herbal medicine, homeopathy, naturopathy, osteopathy, traditional Chinese medicine, or Unani medicine. Personally, I think the only one that I have used in that list is naturopathy, which kind of crosses over into some of those other ones. What about you, Kat? Well, my experience was with herbal medicines, or I prefer to call them herbal remedies. I think a lot of people like to quote the great Tim Minchin when he states that, quote, you know what they call alternative medicine that's been proved to work? Medicine, end quote. That's an amazing quote. <laughs> uh, isn't it the best quote? I just love Tim Minchin. That leads us into your story because it is all about herbal remedies. Can you 
Tell us your story. All right. Well, when I was 20 or 21 years old, I was told by my family doctor that I should start taking steroids for my asthma. I was not too keen on that idea. And a friend of my mother suggested that I go to her herbalist instead. Her family had been seeing him for about 10 years. He'd been in business for 25 years, biggest herbalist in my city. And so I went. I thought, what could it hurt? I was really cautious about the herbs, and I read up on everything I was taking and how they could interact with each other. I thought I was making an informed decision. My one ignorance was that I didn't know herbs and health foods weren't regulated in Canada. I was naive and assumed that everything sold in Canada was regulated. As I think a lot of people do believe and still believe, correct? Absolutely. It didn't take long for me to notice a big difference in how I was feeling. The sinus issues I battled my entire life and my asthma were no longer a problem. I was breathing freely. I was working out two hours a day, seven days a week. Yet I was gaining a lot of weight, and I'm not talking muscle. (laughs) That must have been really concerning and confusing at the time. It was, and I was noticing that I had limited mobility in my neck. My cuts and bruises were taking a long time to heal. I had trouble concentrating. I was also feeling really moody and emotional. So I went back to my family doctor, and the only suggestion she had was to stop taking the herbs just to see what would happen. And I've always questioned authority, so I didn't stop taking the herbs because (laughs) they seemed to be helping me. Right. And I didn't think that the ill effects I was feeling could be side effects from taking herbs. Right. To me, they were doing good. It never occurred to me that this could be a side effect or that it would be related. Side note, if I had stopped taking them, we wouldn't be having this conversation because I'd be dead. But I'm skipping ahead of my story. But that's some pretty severe consequences. Definitely. And I'm guessing that the doctors were trying to figure out what was wrong. Absolutely. So the Coles Notes version, to use your Canadian phrase of the other week. That's right. Is that I was sent for a battery of tests. It kicked off five and a half months of testing. Two to three times a week, I was going for blood tests or biopsies or ultrasounds. None of the specialists I was seeing, because I was seeing so many specialists at this time, would tell me what they were looking for. They would only tell me what they'd ruled out after the test came back. So I would go to get my test results and they'd say, oh, well, you don't have this kind of cancer and we've ruled out this and we've ruled out that. Right. It was a very, very stressful time of my life. And were you working at the time or in school? What were you doing? I was working um, at the university, so it was really handy. I was very close to the hospital so I could go and get these tests done in my coffee break or my lunch hour. (laughs) So how long did you actually take the herbs for, Kat? I'd been taking the herbs for about 10 months. And in those 10 months, I'd gained about 50 kilograms, which is about 110 pounds. I didn't recognize myself in the mirror anymore. And the doctor said that if I hadn't been eating so well and exercising so much, I likely would have gained twice as much weight in that short period because I had developed Cushing syndrome. They weren't sure why, though, because that normally is associated with adrenal cancer. And I did not have that. And can you just go into a little bit of detail about what Cushing syndrome is? Um, It's basically when your adrenal system shuts down. And usually that is because of adrenal tumors, which is Cushing's disease or Cushing syndrome. The adrenal system is the one that produces hormones, correct? Is that right? Yes. It produces um, your adrenaline. It produces your cortisol, gives you the fight or flight, all that fun stuff. So I had Cushing syndrome, but they weren't sure why, because I didn't have the adrenal cancer that normally goes along with Cushing's. And one day my endocrinologist was talking with a pediatric specialist over lunch about their unique cases. The peds doctor had three patients with very odd symptoms. None of the children had the same symptoms as each other, but I had all of their symptoms. I was the key. And it turned out we were all taking asthma one, which was the herb that I'd been taking for 10 months. So the endocrinologist asked me if he could test some of my herbs. I gladly gave him some, and the test showed that asthma one had an ingredient not listed on the packaging, which was cow gallstones. And they were acting like a cortical steroid 12 times more potent than prednisone. Wow, that to me is just astounding. I don't know any other way of saying it. I know. I was taking nine capsules a day or the equivalent of 108 prednisone a day, which is why I developed Cushing syndrome, because you'll see Cushing syndrome happen when somebody goes through a transplant. They have to go on high-dose steroids. 
they get the moony face and they get a lot of the symptoms that I had because they've developed secondary Cushing syndrome. Right. Whereas Cushing's disease, you have usually an adrenal cancer with that. So yeah, it was shocking. And the other patients, the children were on a lower dose, which is why they weren't presenting all of the symptoms that I had. And had I stopped taking the herbs cold turkey, like my GP had suggested five months in, I would have died because I almost died when they knew what it was and they were trying to wean me off. They had a lot of trouble figuring out what to do in this situation. Yeah, because nobody takes 108 prednisone a day. They had no (laughs) idea how to wean me off that dose. You were a case study in action. I really, truly was. And yes, I am in some medical textbooks now. Thank you. Thank you. I'm so famous. (laughs) But my sister was also taking a lower dose of the same herb. And luckily, because of my situation, we were able to wean her off successfully And she doesn't have any lasting effects, unlike me. Unfortunate for you, but very fortunate for her. Yes, because I have a litany of health issues now to contend with. Yes, yeah. So Long lasting. And they were actually suggesting that you may not even live to your 30th birthday. And I'm happy to say that you not only live to your 30th birthday, but are still here to be on the skeptic zone. That's right. <laughs> yeah, when they when they told me, to, you know, when I was 21, almost 22, they said, you know, get your affairs in order because you're, you're not going to live long. You're not going to be able to work full time. And I've never stopped. And I told them I'm going to be 80 and dancing on their graves. So and I hope that comes true. Right. I'm, I'm, I still dance every day just in case, you know, <laughs> got, got to stay in shape, got to keep training. Um, one One of the side effects that I have to contend with is I no longer produce adrenaline which they're not really sure how I'm (laughs) on the planet. (laughs) But because of that, I can't drive. Right. Because it would be like I'm driving drunk. So this has really impacted my life in so many ways, not just because I have chronic illnesses now, but just basic things like not being able to drive to get groceries when it's minus 30 out. I know a lot of listeners are in Australia, but up in northern Canada here, it gets cold. (laughs) It does. And for those U.S. uh, listeners... Minus 30 is in Celsius, not Fahrenheit. Bloody cold is is how we would convert that. And Kat, what I think impresses me is what you have chosen to do going forward. And from my understanding, you actually do some work with students at the University of Alberta. Can you tell us about that? When this all came about, everyone was asking, like, did you sue the herbalist? And no, because there were no regulations in place. I did not have that option. I could only sue the government. I went the other way. I decided to work with the government on a volunteer basis, and I wanted to educate everyone. I spoke to every healthcare provider I could. I became involved with lecturing to pharmacy students, and I'm also a medical student mentor now to just get the word out about the dangers of herbal remedies and how serious these consequences can be for people. A a tremendous value to the students to, to see this. And I believe you have a story that you told me that involved your mother. Can you tell me that story again? (laughs) Oh, yes. My mother, she had to have a hip replacement. Bad arthritis runs in her family. And uh, while she was going in for her intake, a pharmacy resident came into her and was asking the typical questions of, you know, what medications are you on? And he kept insisting, like, are you taking anything else? Are you taking any vitamins, minerals, herbal products? And my mother was insistent that no, she wasn't. And he's like, it's very important that you let me know if you are. Because this woman came to my class and she told me. (laughs) And my mom just kind of looked at him and said, hmm, Long red hair, piercing blue eyes, bit of a weird sense of humor. Yeah, that's my kid. (laughs) So she was well aware of the dangers of herbal remedies and to not take them and to disclose them when you do take them. (laughs) Exactly. And what's so great about that is that it shows that they were really paying attention, or at least that student was really paying attention, which was, and hopefully all the students were, will take that to heart and keep that in mind in their practices going forward. In the decade or so that I was speaking to the pharmacy students, I would always do it in the first few weeks of term. And every single year on most of the course evaluations, I was mentioned. Wow. So they were remembering me at the end of the term. And I think that is very true in most cases. If you read something in a book, it doesn't stick with you as much as if you see somebody's face and you can talk to them and you can hear their story, ask questions about their experience. Yeah. It tends to stick with you a lot harder. 
That's why I talk about this. A minute ago, you mentioned that you also volunteered with Health Canada. Can you go into a little bit more details about that? And recently, we've had some good news about yes. regulations. Yes. Yeah, so I worked with Health Canada as part of a consultant team to get natural health products or NHP regulations in place in Canada. They came into place on January 1st, 2004. Yay. They still aren't great, but they're better than nothing yes. <laughs> because now at least we, we have some recourse. And this last July, we had a regulation put in place that it's called Vanessa's Law, and it makes it mandatory for all healthcare providers to report adverse reactions related to NHPs. And before that wasn't mandatory for them. So, And there's been quite an outcry with naturopaths and supplement providers because they're, they feel that it's invading their rights and their ability to make profit and it's going to cost everybody so much money. Oh, and they say that it's going to take away products from the market yeah. and they're very fear mongering. And really, it's because manufacturers still only have to self attest to the efficacy mm -hmm. of their products. They say that they don't want to be regulated as strict as as drugs are, and they aren't by a long shot. The EU has the best regulations that I've read so far. Canada's NHP regulations are nowhere near as strict as they are for food or drugs. Which is typical in a lot of countries, correct? Absolutely. Australia has similar regulations to Canada, but the USA doesn't have any, except for the few supplements that fall under their dietary um, supplement umbrella. Right. And the product that I took, Asthma One, it's also known as Tricopect. It's still available around the world today. So <laughs> there, people need to be educated about this. <laughs> exactly. And I think we found it on Etsy and eBay and you can get it out of India. There's lots of places you can still get it. Now, whether or not it still has cow gallstones in it, we don't know. Right. Because it was never listed on the package. Correct. And it's still not listed on the package. <laughs> <laughs> this has been a constant problem. Uh, for example, at the end of September... Kate Hull from MSN, she reported on warnings from the National Institute of Health about St. John's wort. Apparently, it's used for all kinds of things like ADHD, depression, menopause, etc. And it has interactions that can be dangerous with prescription medications. Actually, it has the most drug interactions of any natural health product I've found. Tell me about some of those interactions. Well, St. John's wort makes prescription medication less effective. So whether you're on the birth control pill or whether you're taking antibiotics or you're taking ADHD medication, it is going to completely suppress the efficacy of those prescription drugs. And it can even have dangerous side effects when it's mixed with certain medications. And another one that you looked into was called Golden Seal. Can you tell us about that? Yes, golden seal is used primarily for digestion issues or to help with colds and hay fever. And it is the actual reverse of St. John's wort in that it can make prescription medication more potent, causing toxic levels of uh, prescription medication to be released into your bloodstream. So that's a little dangerous. Let's briefly talk about green tea extract. I mean, green tea is the cure-all for everything, isn't it, Kat? Well, it's used for mental alertness and weight loss. It must be a miracle drug, but it's actually been linked to liver damage, so maybe not. <laughs> and the last one we're going to talk about briefly is called Kratom, which is quite popular right now. I think there's a bit of a trend happening, is there not? There is a big trend for Kratom at the moment. It is an energy booster, mood enhancer when taken at low doses. And when taken at higher doses, it's used as a pain reliever or even as a sedative because it has similar effects to opioids, narcotics, and stimulants. And it has similar risks of abuse and addiction. But it's natural, so it's okay. Yeah, you'd like to think so. But in America, who has the most relaxed regulations, the FDA lists Kratom as a drug of chemical concern. And its unregulated nature makes it, and all herbs, difficult to determine which ingredients are actually present. Uh, some reports suggest that there has been specific caution about potential heavy metal and bacterial contamination, and it's recently been banned in seven American states, including Florida, where you can't buy it unless you're over 21, and it is illegal in Australia, New Zealand, Canada, Denmark, and several other countries, However, you can easily find it on the internet. Yeah, we had no trouble finding Canadian sites selling it. Saying it was perfectly legal in Canada, which it's not. 
So Kat, this has been an amazing story that you shared with us. And thank you so much for sharing it. Do you have any last words to share with the audience? Well, I think as long as there's a perception that natural equates to safe, we have to be diligent to ensure product safety and consumer awareness. Because to quote my lovely sister, snake bites are all natural too, but I don't recommend them. And I think that's a great way to end. Kudos to your sister. Well, thanks so much for joining me again, Kat. I have so much fun every time we get together and I hope we do it again soon. Thank you so much for having me and I'll come back anytime you want. Awesome. And also, I want to give her a shout out because we mentioned Cole's notes earlier. It was Kat who came up with that one and reminded me it was a Canadian expression. Until next time, this is Adrian Hill. G'day, Dr. Carl here, popping up on your beloved Richard Saunders podcast, inviting you to follow me on TikTok, where things are much faster. And it all has to happen in a minute or less. So why do diet drinks get you drunker? For example, a rum and diet cola versus a rum and regular cola. Why do we hear the ocean in a seashell? Is coffee good or bad for you? With regard to farts, what happens when you hold them in? And why do farts smell worse in the shower? And the old wooden spoon, as used in cooking, does have a very porous surface. So in terms of bacteria, is it safe to use? And of course, we all know that destiny shapes our ends, but so do the natural electrical fields that we generate. And marijuana munchies might be related to a 500 million year old mutation that makes eating enjoyable via our natural cannabinoids that our body makes. Just follow me on TikTok at Dr. Carl, D-R-K-A-R-L, to find out the answer to all these questions and more. everyone, this is Adrienne Hill from Skookum Studios in Calgary, Canada, here to read the highlights from the Australian Skeptics Newsletter. Because as Richard says, this all makes sense. This is newsletter number 184. You can subscribe to this newsletter and get it delivered to your inbox every other week, complete with links to all the stories. Just visit www.skeptics.com.au. But now, let's see what Tim Mendham has for us this week. Hi all, says Tim. Just over six weeks until Skepticon in Melbourne. So book your tickets now for in-person or online attendance. And you can still nominate a worthy candidate for the Ben Spoon. So many opportunities for you. In the meantime, did you know that last Friday, Friday the 13th of course, was International Skeptics Day. We hope you did something skeptical. The host of this podcast, The Skeptic Zone, happened to be traveling from Australia to the United States on that very day. So he experienced two Friday the 13th in a row. Lucky guy. Talk about being an international skeptic. Read on, Tim. Okay, Tim, I'll do just that. Nominate a preposterous piffletter. Now, it seems like Tim is making up words that I have to try to pronounce. Pifflet? Piffletter? Or pifflater? I'm not sure. Still time to put in your nomination for the Australian Skeptic's Bent Spoon. The award goes to the perpetrator of the most preposterous piece of paranormal or pseudoscientific piffle of the year. Nominations can be made via the website or by emailing the editor at skeptics.com.au. The winner will be announced at the Skepticon dinner on December 2nd, along with the more positive awards of Skeptic of the Year, the Thornet Award for the Promotion of Reason, and the Wallaby Award for Media Critical Thinking. Update, Skepticon 2023. The speaker list is growing. More speakers have been announced for Skepticon to be held in Melbourne on December 2nd through 3rd. Annie McCubbin will present on protecting ourselves, and especially women, 
from scams and bad decision making by understanding cognitive flaws. And Mal Vickers, a past Skeptic of the Year winner, on problems with regulation that have allowed the quack products market to thrive, a topic he has devoted much time and energy to. There are many more speakers being announced, so head to the website to check out the full list at skepticon.org.au. All good reasons to be there on December 2nd through 3rd at the Ian Potter Auditorium in the Kenneth Meyer Building, University of Melbourne, Parksville. Tickets cover one and two day bookings, full price and concession, as well as the dinner itself. Tickets for online viewing are also available. Fake TikTok Doctor Convicted and Fined This is the sad case of a woman with a need to impress people whose offenses were, quote, extensive, prolific, and pervasive, end quote. Not to mention dangerous. The host of the Skeptic Zone podcast wonders why more fake doctors in the community are not prosecuted. I wonder that too. Unmasking the color myth. Not color as in skin, but personal preferences, which is an issue of concern as it can be used to decide how we deal with other people and can influence employment prospects. And this is as silly as graphology, which is also used for the same application. U.S. survey. Find 42% feel paranormal presence in their home. And yet, only 16% think their house is haunted. This is a survey by a home repair company perhaps offering an exorcism while repairing those block gutters and includes lots of interesting graphs. The richest psychic mediums. This is surprisingly unlucrative for a rich list. Being mediums, they're neither rare nor well done. Oh, Tim. <laughs> The richest, no surprise, is John Edward, who is supposedly worth about 29 million US dollars. Can coffee help you avoid weight gain? Research has shown that there is a modest link between coffee and gaining less weight than expected, i.e. it slows your already growing weight. Quote, People who drank an extra cup of coffee a day gained 0.12 kilograms less weight than expected over four years. Adding sugar resulted in a fraction more, so 0.09 kilograms of weight gain than expected over four years, end quote. Does that mean drinking coffee with sugar will reduce your weight gain by 30 grams? Or for those of you who are unfamiliar with the metric system, one quarter of a quarter pounder. The September 2023 issue of The Skeptic is out. It's packed full of essential reading and goodies. A special feature looks at the risks, the critics, and the hoaxes associated with the final and high profile days of the golden age of parapsychology. There's also a review of the World Health Organization's promotion of Alt-Med and the rehabilitation of Yuri Geller, at least as far as the New York Times is concerned. You can read that report on the WHO's Embracing Wu as a sample from the September issue. And if you haven't subscribed yet, now is the time to do so. You can sign up for a hard copy or digital edition or both, since the digital is offered free to those who take up the hard copy version. Contact the editor if you're not sure if your existing subscription needs renewing. <music> Items of interest. Bigfoot sighted in mountains by couple on train. Quite an interesting clip taken from a tourist steam train in Colorado, but Probably a fake. One suggestion is that it is the boss of a local tour company called, not surprisingly, Sasquatch Expedition Trailers, who apparently likes to dress up as footy. 
I think it would have been fair neat to have been on that train to see the suited Sasquatch. Catch an alien on your ring camera and win one million US dollars. This is a promo for a doorbell camera. Unlikely they'll have to pay out. Something for ding-dongs? <laughs> well, I actually have a ring doorbell and it has caught some pretty fun stuff. Some kind of spooky images that I've shared with Kenny Biddle. But I have yet to see an alien. Listicle number one. The 17 scariest haunted hotels around the world. There is a slight problem with this list because 16 out of the 17 are in the US, the other one being in London. Either the rest of the world is ghost free or the author of this list <laughs> has no idea what the world means. <laughs> Listicle number two, the five most haunted places in Las Vegas. This one would be handy if one of these was the Flamingo Hotel, where PsyCon is being held next week. But it's not. So maybe just a side excursion during the lunch breaks. Bedfordshire Hotbed of Supernatural Activity Fun times in what is generally regarded as England's most boring county. Actually, it doesn't seem that bad, especially as your editor lived there for a while more pagans than you can poke a hazel stick at. And the city of Luton, which according to comedian Diane Morgan, is chiefly known for hat making and Satanism, and the Luton Girls Choir, which doesn't exist anymore, so it probably doesn't count, unless they were all Satanists. My favorite, silliest story of the week. Me and my four-year-old can talk to the dead. This has to be the weirdest story you've ever seen. All nine lines of it, including hot links to nothing and a logic that beggars belief. Quote, my son was talking to someone. I thought it was my husband. It was a different kid, end quote. Don't bother reading it. Just know it exists and despair. <laughs> Well, that's the newsletter, and today's phrase is fair neat. And this is a very localized one. In fact, it's so localized that as far as I know, there's only one place it has ever been used, and it appears to have even disappeared from there now. I could only find references to this phrase on several Facebook threads. And apparently in the past, there were even t-shirts made. From the age of four through nine, I lived in the small community of Cranbrook, located in southeast British Columbia, about 400 kilometers west of Calgary. If we thought something was amazingly awesome, we would say it was fair neat. You could even use it to replace cool, as in, hey, let's go and find some ghosts, with the reply being, fair neat. When I moved to Edmonton, just north of Calgary, I was teased and quickly lost my desire to say this. And you may be interested to know that Cranbrook was where I lived when I experienced my very first ghost encounter. And I tell this story on a Skeptoid episode, which will air on, you guessed it, October 31st, US time. I'm thinking this will be a fair, neat episode. Until next time, this is Adrian Hill. Hi, I'm Ben Radford, co-host of Squaring the Strange podcast. In these trying times, as we help each other out to hold on to hope, we want you to know that we're here for you. Hey, hey, hey what are you going on about? Who's interrupting my heartfelt promotional copy? It's me, Celestia Ward, your co-host. Really? In these trying times? That's the best you can do? Well, I'm just doing what everyone else is doing. I thought... That's not what we do. Oh, for crying out loud, who else is here? Pasquale Romero, your other co-host? Hey. We don't do what everybody else does, Ben. That's kind of our thing at Squaring the Strange. Yeah, we try to approach things a little differently than your standard skeptical talky talk show. 
We do our own thing, bringing science, critical thinking, and skepticism to bear on issues of the day. We've got a professional skeptical author, Ben, who has decades of experience researching topics for a dozen books and thousands of articles. And a cartoonist skeptic, Celestia, who knows her stuff when it comes to facial weirdness and the psychology of perception. And a badass heavy metal rock star and tech engineer, Pasquale, who brings knowledge of all things audio, plus a bunch of neck tattoos. Squaring the Strange explores topics both mysterious and mundane through a critical lens. Monsters, panics, media literacy. Okay, forget the whole trying times promo idea. But we have chupacabras and clown panics, right? Yes, Ben. Yes, Ben. ben. Time to once again dive back into the archives. The newspaper archives, normally we go to Trove at trove.nla.gov.au, but occasionally we go to other resources like the uh, Sydney Morning Herald newspaper and its microfilm archives at the State Library of New South Wales, where I go occasionally and spend a few hours with stacks and stacks and stacks of reels of microfilm. And I look for general topics of interest to skeptics, and I came across this interesting item, dated way back in 1988, on the 24th of December. Superpower deep in thought. Art Levine, Charles Van Vesey, and Stephen Emerson report on the importance Washington places on psychic phenomena. It seems that Nancy Reagan has plenty of good company. Last May, she was the butt of jokes around the world after it was revealed that she routinely consulted with a San Francisco astrologer about presidential scheduling decisions. The former White House Chief of Staff, Donald Reagan, who made the revelations, derided the scheduling as a, quote, long-established floating seance, end quote. Despite such digs and skepticism from mainstream scientists, there is extensive interest in psychic phenomena, called psi, in Washington. At any given time, about one quarter of the members of Congress are actively interested in psi, be that healing, prophecy, remote viewing, or physical manifestation of psychic powers, such as bending spoons or erasing computer tapes. According to Democratic Representative Charlie Rose, He is an eight-term veteran who founded the Congressional Clearinghouse on the Future, a forum that has given some psychics a platform in the Capitol. Most legislators and aides interested in psychic phenomena will not go public for fear of being ridiculed. Another fear among politicians is that they would be condemned by fundamentalists as being in league with the devil. But sources say the Capitol's many psi aficionados satisfy their curiosity in the eerie zone of privately consulting with seers and discussing the subject with like-minded colleagues. For instance, the Speaker of the House, Jim Wright, and his wife Betty have attended classes and lectures that teach techniques of prophecy. According to one congressional source, Jim thinks he has a great future and he is interested in sharpening his intuitive powers to anticipate and shape the future. Anne Geeman, a Virginia psychic who says she evaluated him, claims Wright has developed strong psychic gifts in recent years. Wright's office denies he had extensive contacts with Geeman, insisting he only saw her lecture once or twice several years ago. There has also been a long-running interest in some military and intellectual circles with psychic research, but advocates of such research fear that governmental aid for future studies might be jeopardized following the release of an army-funded National Academy of Sciences study last December, which found no laboratory evidence that psi was real or that research in psi merited army funding. The committee, established by the NAS's research arm, the National Research Council, looked at the best documented psychic phenomena, including remote viewing, RV, 
and psychokinesis, moving objects with the power of the mind. As part of a wide-ranging study, the panel found that the laboratory studies of Psy were plagued by sloppy methodology and inadequate security against fraud. Psychic proponents denounced the panel as biased and dominated by skeptics. Whatever the outcome of that debate, there is clear evidence, according to knowledgeable sources, that psychics have played important roles in some key government circles. The Pentagon continues to fund a small-scale classified psychic research at SRI International, formerly Stanford Research Institute, a think tank in California, while the CIA and Pentagon monitor Soviet work in this area. The U.S. military and CIA have occasionally used psychics to spy on Soviet weaponry, on General Manuel Noriega, and to find terrorists and hostages in Iran and other countries. The FBI has hosted lectures to police officers by psychic Noreen Renier at its Virginia Training Center. She impressed her listeners by successfully predicting in January 1981 that there would be an assassination attempt on President Reagan in that spring. FBI agents later recommended her to police departments, according to court documents and law enforcement sources. An FBI spokeswoman, Kathy Bradford, says, The FBI doesn't use psychics to solve cases. But she adds... If they, local departments, want a psychic, we'll help anybody who needs help. In addition to seeking help in this world, some legislators, congressional aides and government officials have sought spiritual guidance. Democratic Senator Caliborn Pell, chairman of the State Foreign Relations Committee, is the most vocal advocate on Capitol Hill of psychic research. He has an interest in the supernatural since college, when he considered becoming a minister. His bookcase in his Washington office is a testament to his fascination, with shelves crammed with such books as The Astral Body, which examines out-of-body experiences, and the works of Shirley MacLaine. Pell notes that as he has grown older, he has become increasingly absorbed by the question of life after death. At times, he has sought to communicate with dead relatives. I've been to mediums, but nothing has happened, he adds with regret. I don't have these powers. Nevertheless, from his readings and discussions with researchers, Pell believes that there are genuine psychics. Psychic claims are important, and they shouldn't be ridiculed. He says they should be studied. His office has been using the National Science Foundation, the Defense Department, and other government agencies to fund far more psychic research. He also asks for the skeptical NAS study to be withdrawn because of its alleged bias, but his efforts have met with little success. Pell's interest in psi is so strong that he has had a full-time aide former Naval Intelligence Officer C.B. Scott Jones, whose primary responsibility for three and a half years has been to monitor and encourage consciousness research, including studies of psychic phenomena. Indeed, Pell says Joan screens psychics for him. In his off-duty hours, Jones helped arrange at least one session in which efforts were made to contact dead Soviet leaders. According to some accounts by psychic activists, the aim was to encourage these uh, ghostly heads of state to bombard the minds of living Soviet leaders with thoughts of peace. Jones will not discuss detail. Do you, do you, do you remember, have you read... The Men Who Stare at Goats. That reminds me of this. (laughs) Jones will not discuss details. He will only say... It was a very private experiment. We closed it down. We felt it was unnecessary. This has nothing to do with the senator or my job. In the spring of 1986, Jones invited psychic buffs including some Pentagon officials, to his home to hear a tape recording of spirit voices and messages according to sources who attended the meeting. 
The purported spirit world communications ranged from William Randolph Hearst discoursing on power to a long-dead physics professor saying in robot-like tones, I love fried cabbage. Pell's own pursuits have not been as unusual as his aids, but he has offered psychic Yuri Geller platforms to demonstrate his skills. They first met in a London hotel in 1986, where Geller impressed Pell by bending spoons and duplicating a drawing Pell made, apparently without looking at Pell's sketch. As mementos, Pell keeps the bent spoon and two drawings of a smiling face in his Washington office. Though Geller has been denounced by some psychic advocates as a charlatan, Pell says he remains impressed, adding with a touch of self-mocking irony, I'm a sucker. Sucker or not, Pell has arranged for Geller to perform mind-reading stunts at high-powered Washington gatherings and in Geneva, where Geller claims he beamed peaceful thoughts into the minds of Yuli Vorontsov, the Soviet's armed negotiator. Apologies if I have not pronounced that correctly. The next day, Geller notes, the Soviets offered to eliminate medium-range missiles from Europe. Charlie Rose's interests in Psy stems from his desire to harness it for foreign and military policy. After he joined the House Select Committee on Intelligence in 1977, he became fascinated by CIA-backed remote viewing experiments, that involved alleged psychic ability to describe sights and even documents at long distances. At one point, he advocated a, quote, psychic Manhattan project, end quote, for remote viewing and other mental techniques. He now favors sharing information on Psy with the Soviet and Chinese because of changes he sees in communist societies. Rose's positive view on psychic abilities is quietly shared by some other congressmen and influential political leaders, including at least one Reagan cabinet member, say ambassadors and numerous politicians, psychic sources and other witnesses. One congressman interviewed and evaluated about 20 psychics who were brought to his office one by one and tested by a staffer, according to Milton Friedman a former speechwriter to President Ford, and a senior aide to Republican Senator Jacob Javits in the 1970s. Some did surprisingly well, others failed. And I'll break in here and say, uh, tested by a staffer. I wonder what his qualifications were in testing psychic phenomena. The government's use of psychics has focused on military matters. In the 1960s, the CIA was ordered to get a picture of a new Soviet rocket, according to a CIA source. Stumped, the agency hired a Chicago truck driver who had a reputation for being able to cause images of objects many kilometers away to appear on a photo negative held against his forehead. The photo produced by the truck driver showed details that enabled the CIA to pinpoint the way a booster was strapped to the rocket. The truck driver was a, quote, messy disagreeable fellow, end quote, who insisted on drinking a lot of beer <laughs> before he delivered his pictures, recalls the official. But the rocket image turned out to be accurate, and the experiment raised a lot of interest. Most people were skeptical, says the official. But the truck driver's work was not dismissed as a trick. There was enough evidence to validate further study, but there was never enough to prove that psychic research is a reliable, useful tool for intelligence purposes. Even the most talented psychics, the CIA official says, tend to lose their powers over time and are not consistently accurate. And I'll break in here and say that sounds like cherry-picking. Systematic, multi-million dollar experiments began in the 1970s, when Pentagon and CIA officials became increasingly alarmed over Soviet research in the field. I remember, I remember a line James Randi did, saying that uh, these government departments were spending millions and millions of dollars on this psychic research, and for uh, a dime they could have called him up <laughs> instead. <laughs> we read on. 
And some of the conclusions of analysts in the Defense Intelligence Agency, CIA and Army, make scary reading. A 1972 DIA report warned that the Soviets might one day be able, at a distance, to control the thoughts of U.S. leaders, disable military equipment, and even, quote, cause the instant death of any U.S. official, end quote. One problem with these reports, some analysts outside the military say, is that they lack scientific documentation and even subscribe unwittingly to Soviet disinformation. Since the 1970s, the U.S. has focused primarily on researching remote viewing. The work has been subsidized at SRI, the California think tank, by the CIA, DIA, and other government agencies, Sources familiar with the research say. Details of the current work are classified, and the director of research, Ed May, declined to comment. Military support for SRI's psychic research is estimated to be a few hundred thousand dollars a year. The researchers at SRI have claimed nearly a 70% accuracy rate for their remote viewing tests. In a typical experiment, a psychic is closeted in a laboratory and asked to describe an undisclosed location being visited by SRI researchers. His descriptions are compared with the actual site. Over the years, there have also been several published reports about the U.S. using psychics to spy on such things as a Soviet nuclear facility. However, last December, the National Academy of Sciences panel found the case for remote viewing to be, quote, virtually non-existent, end quote. Yet true believers, as well as desperate pragmatists in government, have turned to psychics in emergencies posed by counter-terrorism and espionage, according to government officials and psychic researchers. Some highlights. The families of American hostages in Lebanon have employed psychics to provide information, and some of these visions occasionally have drifted into weekly reports filed with President Reagan by the National Security Council about hostages' whereabouts, sources say. In 1980, government officials asked a psychic hired by the SRI to describe the health of hostages held in the Tehran embassy. The psychic, according to some accounts was accurate regarding Richard Queen, a multiple sclerosis victim Iran eventually released in July 1980. But one former White House official familiar with the incident recalls being unimpressed because the psychic's description of Queen's condition was vague. Psychics were extensively used in the planning of a potential Iranian rescue operation after the debacle of Desert One in April 1980 as well as in late 1983, during an operation to track down those responsible for the deaths of the 241 U.S. servicemen killed by a suicide bomber in Lebanon. But the missions were never carried out, and the psychics' reports could not be confirmed. In the early 1980s, sources say, the Army's Intelligence and Security Command, INSCOM, under the direction of a psychic believer, General Albert Stubblebean, arranged for psychics to describe the interior of the home of General Noriega, who was suspected of drug trafficking and other crimes. The U.S. counterintelligence operatives in Panama, who were given the psychic's top-secret two-page report, never corroborated it because they were spotted by Noriega's guards before entering his home. Oh dear. The future of such official use of psychics is cloudy, though it is likely that there will always be those who will turn to psychics in emergencies when other resources have failed. It is even more certain that government leaders in Washington, like many citizens in other parts of the country, will continue to be drawn to the mystery of Psy. What a fascinating report that was all the way back there in 1988 and how valuable it is to have such a report so we can look back nearly, what, 30, 
26 years or thereabouts to see what people were doing back then. So we can realize that in the decades and decades since this, despite all the efforts and all the belief, none of this has come to fruition. Ideas best left to the trash bin of history. You too can discover many ideas that should be left in the trash bin of history by going to trove at trove.nla.gov.au or in this case as I did, going to the uh, listings on the Sydney Morning Herald and running down to the library to find the, uh, the microfilm and making copies that way. No matter how you do it, no matter how you do it, you never know what you might find. Thank you for listening to the Skeptic Zone podcast in the coming weeks. I hope to bring you interviews from people who will be speaking at Skepticon 2023 in Melbourne. And if you haven't got your ticket, now's the time to do so. You can also get tickets to watch it online, no matter where you are around the world. Now, this is the Australian Skeptics National Convention. It's held this year on the 2nd to the 3rd of December. All the information is at skepticon.org.au and you'll hear speakers such as Adam Ford, who is a futurist. I wonder what a futurist does. But lots of other speakers. Check them out at skepticon.org.au. Thank you to those people who continue to support The Skeptic Zone at skepticzone.tv with your weekly or monthly contributions with PayPal or Patreon. That means the show can keep going. And on the show next week, Tim Mendham with another book of Tim, and he's going to look at flying saucers. The Trove segment's going to look at general, eh, general paranormal goings-on. And as I said before, I hope to bring you some interviews from speakers going to Skepticon this year. Now, for those of you in the States, next weekend I will be travelling to Las Vegas to attend SciCon 2023. Actually, that'll be a good opportunity for me to get even more interviews from uh, speakers at Skepticon. Yes, SciCon Las Vegas, Skepticon Melbourne. It's all too much. I think I better go and lie down for a while. Until next week, this is Richard Saunders signing off from Oakland, California. You've been listening to the Skeptic Zone podcast. Please visit our website at www.skepticzone.tv for episodes and show notes with links going back to 2008. You can follow the Skeptic Zone on Facebook, X, TikTok and YouTube by clicking the links at our homepage, together with links to support the show financially via Patreon or PayPal. The Skeptic Zone is an independent production. The views and opinions expressed by our guests are not necessarily those of the Skeptic Zone podcast or any other sceptical organisation. For those of you who are sticking around after the closing music for the fun bits... We're going to play the dice game. Exactly. Each of us has a 10-sided die. Which were gifts from Richard. Thank you, Richard. So let's roll. You can roll yours first. And let's see. I'm going to guess it's a six. I'm going to go with a four. Okay. Oh, it's a nine. Oh, our psychic hats aren't working very well today. Let's try another well, the one. six upside down would, you know. <laughs> You were close. I was close. Very close. I just, I saw the number upside down. I'm going to stick with it. Okay. I'm going to roll mine and I'm going to say it's a six again. I'm going with a two. And Susan's going with a five. Always. It's a four. (sighs) Can't believe it. Okay. Like I was just predicting what you were going to (laughs) roll. That's all. (laughs) Okay. Exactly. So last one. Cat, you go ahead. I'm going to say this time it's a nine. I'm going to go with seven. 
I got excited there, but it's only a one. It's a one. I thought it was a seven at first glance. Our psychic powers apparently are not with us today. (sighs) Man. All right. I guess we have to go back to our day jobs or some junk. I don't know. Uh, I think so. (laughs) (laughs) Especially easy for you since you're retired. But Yeah, there you go. (laughs) I'm glad I don't work for the Psychic Friends Hotline because I'd be fired. (laughs) You're so good. I'm keeping that one in. (laughs) And Richard will cut it out. (laughs) I don't think so. (laughs) He takes bribes though, right? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. There you go. (laughs) 